you for the attendees that are here. I think we're just going to wait a couple more minutes. We still have people trickling in. It's a beautiful day out. So I'm sure a lot of people are attending to their, their crops and, um, and everything else that goes with that. But we'll just, um, so everybody knows this meeting is being recorded and um, we are very happy to host you again for another one of our um, webinar series um, in the alternative berry production system series that we've been uh, having uh, between uh, UW-Madison and uh, University of Minnesota. Um, we um, today have a, a guest speaker from Michigan State University that I'll introduce in a couple minutes before I do some, after I do some housekeeping. Um, this is a webinar, so please feel free to type in your questions in the chat or the Q&A. We'll monitor those and we'll make sure to uh, address all of your questions at the end of the presentation uh, by Dr. Garcia Salazar. Um, we will also conduct a poll at the end of the presentation uh, to see that everything is going uh, well and that uh, we are on the right path with our webinar series. Um, the, the recording will be made available on two different um, sites and I'm going to drop those into the chat as soon as I open the chat. So we have uh, the Wisconsin YouTube channel will have the recording, the past recording and the new recordings that you can see. Uh, here. And then the other one is on the Minnesota uh, small fruit farm YouTube channel and the recordings will be available on either one of those. It will be the same recording. So please feel free to go back and check on those. You will also get uh, a link to that uh, via the email uh, if you've registered for this, um, this webinar. Um, anything else, ladies, that I'm forgetting here? Okay. No, that's so, it. Go ahead. I'll just move on to this next slide and um, just to show you that the um, next two uh, webinars that we have in this series, the next one will be on August 5th and it's on alternative berry and bush crop to boost your bank account by Brian Smith from UW River Falls. And then the last webinar that we'll have is it will be on October 21st and it's building a tabletop day neutral strawberry system by Kate Fessler and Annie Claude from the University of Minnesota. So with that, I will introduce our speaker. And I'm very pleased to, um, to host uh, Dr. Uh, Carlos Garcia Salazar. Um, Dr. Garcia Salazar has been uh, with Michigan State um, University Extension since 2002. He's the small fruit extension educator. Uh, he's responsible for developing curriculum-based educational programs and provide technical assistance to Michigan small fruit industries uh, blueberries, strawberries, and raspberries. Uh, he obtained his master's degree and PhD from Michigan State University with a major in entomology. And um, without further ado, I'll just stop sharing my screen. And uh, Carlos, do you want to uh, share your screen and see if that works for you? Yeah, I'll share it. So we're, we're testing because um, we might have some connection issues, but uh, we'll make sure to um, make everything work if, uh, if we have to switch, so, okay. okay. Carlos, take it away. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Christelle and everybody. Thank you for the invitation to this webinar. The topic that I'm going to discuss today is related to the challenges and opportunities for organic blueberry production. This topic is not very easy because there are few sources of information uh, available. Most of this presentation is based on information that we get from Oregon State, Washington State, Michigan State, uh, California, uh, the blueberry industry, and the US Department of Agriculture. So there is, there is some information, so let, let's work with, with this in with that uh, introduction, I'm going to start with some of the, the opportunities for blueberry production in the, during 
this session that we are going to try to explain a little bit of what are the opportunities for producing organic blueberries. There is an increase in consumer awareness on the health benefits. There is a lot of uh, information that during the few five, six years on the health benefits of blueberries. There is also some interest on a large group of consumer for healthy food. There is also a large middle class with a purchasing power that they are willing to spend the money in uh, quality products and also healthy fruit. There is also a sector of our population that is very concerned with the environment and especially the effect of pesticides on the environment, on pollinators and even in, in the human health. And there is also a group of people that prefer healthy food. And we have a large, large sector of people like uh, vegans that they want to consume healthy organic food. And there are there is also concern for the human health. Uh, even though pesticides looks to be uh, uh, harmless, there are some secondary effects like uh, allergies, especially for people with uh, environmental allergies that they are more concerned with this uh, uh, type of food that has uh, the minimum amount of uh, chemicals. There is also decrease of market opportunity through niche markets, especially during the, the after the pandemic. Or the, still, we are under the pandemic, but in Michigan we went of almost one year in, on under confinement, and after the the confinement start being uh, relaxed during the, the 2020 season, we saw a tremendous amount of growth of people going into the u peaks around Lansing, Grand Rapids, big cities. People are eager to go outside, collect uh, the fruit, healthy food, fruit, and enjoy the environment. So this is a big opportunity for organic production. Profits, this is uh, something that is not very clear. There are cases where you really get a good price for your berries, but there are other cases where your berries are worth the same the non-organic berries. Regarding the health benefits, blueberries are low calorie and high in fiber and very nutritious product. The Center for Disease Control called them uh, the powerhouse fruit and the Mayo Clinica called them the superfood. And all blueberries pro provide vitamin K and uh, manganese, these are two very important vitamins for our human body. Vitamin K is essential in helping your blood to retain the ability to clot. This is very important for people with blood disorders. And manganese is essential to prevent osteoporosis and inflammation, and is especially beneficial for women and elderly people. The other uh, benefits of consuming blueberries is the antioxidants. They are high in content of antioxidants. Antioxidants help to prevent cancer and combat free radicals in our body. They are also uh, the fruit with the highest amount of antioxidants from all the fruits and vegetables that we consume every day. We said that the regular consumption of blueberries uh, can help to repair the cell damage in our body. This data is coming from Lisa the Better and regarding the increased demand for organic blueberries. In 2006, uh, there were only 1,200 hectare, hectares of blueberries by around the world. By the year 2013, it increased to 6,000 hectares. So almost triple the amount of hectares in, uh, devoted to blueberry organic production. The United States and Chile are the major organic blueberry producers. And in 2011, 
the United States had around 1,700 hectares, and uh, Chile had around 1,600 hectares. These numbers have changed already, but uh, this is what we have available at this time. And also uh, regarding the consumer demand, there are no clear data. The only thing that uh, is available is that in 2013, there was a report of the consumption for organic produce was around 11%. And that 33% of this in increment was uh, related to the consumption of fruit and vegetables that include blueberries. In this graphic, you can see uh, in, in the bottom, you, you have uh, this uh, season from November, November 2019 to May 2020, the uh, amount of blueberries non-organic, and then here you have the organic blueberry production. You see, it's a, still it's a very small amount, but it keeps growing. If we consider the origin of these blueberries, most of the blueberries come from the California, from the South and Central Valley, California. You see here, these are the areas where we have the most production of organic blueberries. And there is one reason for that. California is a desert. There are few insect and disease problems that it's easy to, to grow organic blueberries. There has been also some increment in Georgia and Mexico start coming into the market also, but in still very small amount. This, is, uh, this graphic shows you the data from 2016 to 2020 and the weeks of the year in the bottom. You see that by the week, by the 21st week of every year, we reach the maximum amount of organic production in, in, in America. We, but the important thing to notice is that in 2019, we had a peak of around, in the 21st week of around 2 million pounds, but in 2020, it increased 1 million more. So, you can see a tremendous amount of increase in production of organic uh, blueberries because there is a demand for them. One thing that has been very uh, useful and helpful for the producers of organic blueberries is the advertisement campaign uh, launched by the blueberry industry. You can see here that uh, the industry has been uh, in partnership with 41 academic institutions, including Michigan State. And uh, those studies are related to the uh, effect of blueberries on the human health. And there are 59 studies published that have been certified the American Heart Association in which the results uh, prove that there is a beneficial impact of consuming blueberries on the heart, the brain, and your stomach, and your health in general. And uh, for example, uh, checking in this frame, you can see that the promotion of the blueberry industry reaches around last year around 4.0 million people. The Sunday morning show reaches around 3.2 million people. So that uh, impact actually is transformed in consumption of blueberries, including organic blueberries. From the same point of profits, there is a little information on retails, but uh, Lisa Devet had this information that it shows that the difference between the prices in organic and versus non-organic was 25 and 49% higher in 2013 and 2014. The USDA for the year 2014 to 2019 reported that on average, the prices for organic blueberries are 
above two dollars higher than for conventional blueberries. However, those pr prices are not uh, stable. There is a, a lot of variation. In the same week, you can have a difference of 10 cents between organics and non-organic. And at the end of the week, you may have at the, up to $3.60 per, per pound. So it changed during the same week. In, in this uh, graphic, you can see again, from November 2019 to May 2020, the, how the, the prices of blueberries behave during that period. You see that in November 2019, at the end of the blueberry season in the North Hemisphere, uh, but the beginning of the, the South, you can see prices of six point uh, twenty five dollars per pound uh, for uh, organic versus four dollars for conventional blueberries. But by the middle of uh, January, into you can see that difference is just minimal, like a ten cent or twenty cent between organic and conventional. Again, by the, in, in April, when again the market demand for blueberries. Is, uh, is, is increasing and the, the, the supply is, is uh, not constant. You can see again, a higher amount of dollar per pound versus the one that you're getting from blueberries from California or from Florida. So there is a variation in, in, the, in the amount of money that you, you are getting for your organic blueberries. With uh, the success of organic production, it comes the challenges. Uh, many people want to have uh, a, a share in, in this market and they start producing organic blueberries too. But then you here, you can see from 2010 to 2019, you can see that the, uh, the prices in this line shows that in 2015, the price for pound was around uh, $6 per pound, but, but the productivity of blueberries was still low. When you reach more than 40 million pounds, metric tons actually, uh, you see that the prices start declining. So as more people get into the market, the prices will continue dropping down. This is an example uh, also from Lisa, the better, in which she analyzes the market uh, average yield price and gross revenue for organic uh, blueberries in Western and Eastern and Western Michigan, uh, West, uh, Washington from 2009 to 2012. You may see here in this top, you have the yield prices and the revenue. On average, you have around 8,000 pounds per acre. If you compare with organic, with non-organic production in, in that part of the state, you can get uh, on average between 15 and 20,000 pounds per acre. So organic production is, is a much lower yield than conventional. In the Western state, because the climate and conditions are different from the Eastern part of the Washington, you can see that the productivity is very low, 3,000, 4,000 pounds per acre. Prices, you see, not great. $2, $2.50, almost the same that conventional blueberries. And again, the, the revenue, you end up with uh, almost $17,000 per acre in one side, but only $9,000 per acre in the other side. If you see these numbers and you want to convert your farm to organic production, you need to think about it. There are some challenges also for the, uh, the transition to organic production. This uh, study was done in Oregon. It was a, a survey of uh, blueberry growers that were organic certified or the process will be certified. One of the major issues that they see is 
labor. Labor is one issue that they see as a one challenge. Record keeping, remember that you need to keep a record of everything you do in order to maintain your certification. And uh, the cost of certification is also an issue because sometimes you have to pay for director and you may not get the, the amount of money from the certification that you expected. One thing that I like to highlight is the learning process. Uh, here I'll take as, as some, some uh, well, actually pest control is one of the large issues for them. And then the learning process. I have in Michigan, uh, in, over the years that I've been here, a, a group of people that always called our office trying to find out if they can become a, a producers of blueberry, especially they want to produce organically. The, the one example that I have is a, a, a couple that retired from uh, when the uh, Pfizer plant was closed in, in uh, in Holland, Michigan. He has, this family has 40 acres of, of field that wanted to convert to blueberry organic production. And so he had around $400,000 willing to put in, in, in investment. And so they used, I spent like a, six hours with them going over all the details and going to look the field. And uh, basically uh, at the end of the, the, this interview and conversation, I asked them if they had some experience farming and none of them said, no, they, they, they never had any experience in farming. They were interested in producing organic blueberries because there was a good market and they were interested also in healthy food. And when I explained to them what they had to do, uh, basically they just back off and say, yeah, you better are putting this $400,000 in stock market because otherwise you are gonna lose your money. The other situation is with that dentist that wanted to have his own organic blueberries, including other vegetables that he wanted to consume because he was afraid of the pesticides. So he had half an acre of blueberries, organics. And let me tell you, he hasn't seen any blueberries healthy, at least in the last five years. So knowledge is very, very important. And uh, with that, uh, let me, the other challenges are minor, but for me, learning and, uh, is a, a critical issue. Going to the uh, blueberry pest complex, we have the indigenous pest, like the cranberry, cherry fruit worm, aphids, that we have the same, almost the same uh, species, like you have in Wisconsin and, and uh, what, uh, Central, North Central states, Great Lake region. And also we have the new invasive pests like a spider windowsophila. We have the common diseases also. And we have another challenge, regulatory issues, especially the food safety issues. This is a, a serious problem right now under the COVID-19 restriction because we have to uh, have the workers certified that they are free of COVID, vaccinated and tested. And that increases the amount of money, especially if you have a worker that got uh, infected, you have to provide a place where he has to be uh, in quarantine for 14 days. You have to pay the salary for that, that, that worker and, uh, and you have to have the place. You have to have housing or something where you are going to quarantine uh, the, the, the workers that get infected. So. This is a very, very serious challenge for the industry. Going back to the blueberry pest complex, we have the cherry and cranberry fruit worm. These two species can destroy up to 80% of the fruit if we do not control them. Fortunately, we've been able to work a lot on these two pests. We have already some phenology models that we use in environmental weather that we use to, pr to predict when the eggs and larvae are gonna be hatching on, in the field. And for the organic production, Bacillus thuringiensis, Dipel, Javelin are very effective to prevent the infestation of the cherry and cranberry fruit worm. Also, we have a very uh, good 
natural biological control in the fields. If we remove the organophosphates and we remove the very harmful insecticide and we concentrate our early pest control based on, on BT, we will promote uh, a large population of Trichogramma minutum, that is a parasitoid, and Phanerotma, frankly, there's another wasp parasitoid. Here you have them. <coughs> In these pictures, you see the female lying drag on a and a cherry fruit worm. And here is the, uh, the parasitized egg, and here is the, the wasp coming out of the egg. And this is the other species, Phanerotama, that is also egg parasitoid. So this is, we are finding up to 17% of egg parasitoid during the early season when we treat our fields with reduced risk insecticides or with BT. The other important, uh, biological control agent is for aphids. Aphids is a problem because they, they are vectors of uh, two-string virus and other viruses that are affecting the, the blueberries. And uh, this aphidius maticaria is a wasp that can reduce substantially, even crash the population of aphids when the population gets out of control. In these um, graphics, you can see this study was done by Rufus Isaac, and it was a four years sampling. Yeah. And you here see uh, growers, standard control. Yeah. This red line is reduced risk uh, treatments. You may see that this, the population of APHIS increases. Uh, the, they crash the population of aphids. The major issue right now for blueberry production organically is the spotted windowsophila. Why? Because this is a horrible pest that uh, in Michigan, at the beginning of the, the outbreak, we had to spend up to $350 per acre to maintain the population at, at bay reducing even with, with some damage is going to 30, 40% of the, of the yields. Controlling the spider with Drosophila in organic production is a challenge because as we know that they, they go into the, the fruits, they spoil the fruits, and once inside of the fruit, nothing can be done to control them. When we tested uh, our berries, for the presence, presence of this Paraguindosophila larvae uh, is the only way that we can actually know if we have infested fruit. When we submerge the berries on salty water, you may see that the larvae start climbing out of the berries and trying to escape from the salt. This is in blueberries, this is in raspberries. In raspberries, it's very easy to see them, but in blueberries are a little bit challenging. How we manage this paraguin drosophila organically? Well, uh, one of the issues with organic production is that not many people want to harvest every day. But if you have this paraguin drosophila, you have to harvest every day or at least every two days. And this is studied done by, by Matthew Grisho in, in uh, Rufus Isaac. They found, for example, that it's in uh, raspberries, if you harvest uh, every day, like in this line, or every two days, the number of eggs that you're finding per kilogram of berries is just small compared when you wait three days to harvest. You have a tremendous amount, like a three times more eggs, if you wait three days. Undetected larvae, when uh, after you screen the fruits and do whatever to, to smash them and recover the larvae. Again, if you collect every, every day, the amount of larvae per kilogram is very small in comparison if you wait three days. When you submerge the fruits in the salty water, the number of larvae that you detect in one kilogram is, is minimal, almost neglectable. So you need to be 
aware that the most time the ripe fruit is in the field, the greater the chance that will get the festus. So for organic production, it's, very, it's critical to collect the fruit almost every day. There are some organic insecticides available for uh, spotty window sophila control, but the only good one is actually Entrust, that is a spinosad. The other is um, as a direct plus uh, some pyrethrins. But even those insecticides that looks very uh, promising for organic production, they have an impact on other beneficial that may be helping us to reduce other pests like uh, uh, fruit worms. We also have for organic production in the region, in the Great Lake regions, uh, uh, leaf rollers is a pest, but we have uh, several species of parasitoids that have been identified by the Niles, USDA Niles lab here in Michigan. And uh, in those studies done by the Niles lab, the first generation of leaf rollers, uh, between seven and 10% of the old larvae were parasitized. But in the second generation, the amount of parasites increases from 26 to 29%. Most of the major parasitoids are Vasius dimitator and Coloclypius uh, lorus. These are the ones that are our friends that are always present. If we re use reduced risk insecticides or we remove the, the uh, harmful insecticides and we concentrate in something like BT, and then we will allow a greater expression of the natural control in the in blueberry fields. Here is an example of the program that has been recommended by Isaac and Grisha for uh, managing the, the, uh, the fruit work complex and the spotted windows of inland. Basically, it is start with uh, fruit work management at bloom using dipel and uh, at 100 petal fall, 100% petal fall, also a second application of dipel, that is BT. If we have a need, we can repeat the application five days later. Uh, when we have the the fruit in the coloring stage, when we have the presence of the blueberry maggot in the spider window sophila. And timing like here is gonna be based on our trapping system. We need to have these pheromone traps and attractive traps to establish the moment when we need to start spraying against the spider window sophila. The insecticide available for organic production, again, is Entrust plus new film. Those are the compounds that are very effective for stopping the spotting with Drosophila. But um, this, whatever we have, is, there is a very limited uh, thing that we can do with organic uh, insecticides. Another thing, uh, this table is a little bit old and old in the sense that these prices might not be the actual prices. But I got this information from uh, Rincon Vitova from California. And these are the organisms that are available for uh, organic production in, in blueberries. Right now, we are, we are working in this season on Estenema nematos to control the spare window sophila. And I hope that we may get the good results by the end of the next year. But again, you can get the trichogramma, you can get the lace wing and uh, aphidius. So there is a lot of things available for organic production, but uh, the problem is that I do not know any other source available in the Midwest different than Rincon Vitova that could be, provide a uh, continuous supply of uh, biological control agents for uh, organic blueberry production. The other issue that we are trying to work is exclusion. This works for 
blueberries, uh, pest complex like uh, the cranberry fruit worm, cherry fruit worm, for all the pests. And uh, we are seeing this working very well in Canada and so, so some places in New York and in Michigan, we are flying some of those still in experimental base, but it works. Now in Canada, this is a, those pictures are from a tour that we took last uh, two years ago. And you see here, this is a five acre block that has been with screen. This grower is very happy because he is not using any insecticide. He's close to Montreal and he can sell his blueberries for $6, $7 a pound. So he's more than, than willing to maintain his uh, cage, even though uh, it's a little bit expensive, the infrastructure. This is another type of infrastructure that can be used for raspberries, that can be used also for blueberries in small, in small patches. Again, this is a frame with a roof and then the, the, the screen is, is covered and secure in the base. The other situation that, that we try to manage that is one of the challenges was the weed management it was I say in the, in the previous uh, uh, slides is the how to manage weeds in organic uh, production systems. And you see here these, the weeding time per hours per hectare and the cost of labor per hectare. When you don't have mulch that you do all your hand weeding, it's around 291 hours and you pay around $2,900. If you use a straw, with straw, you spend 57 hours per hectare and the cost of labor is only almost $600, $600 per hectare. It's also spoiled grass hay is another alternative that also reduces weeds and the cost of putting this uh, on the field is very economic. However, for me, even though it's, it's expensive, uh, the uh, weed mats, even though it's a little bit expensive, can have a double purpose. First, to control the weeds, but second, to reduce the infestation of spider windows of villa because once the, the, the larvae finishes the uh, uh, larval stage, it drops to the ground, and when there is no bare soil, they just drop onto the weed mat, and the, pre the predation is great, and even the survival is reduced because they are very sensitive to heat. Diseases, I'll skip this because I don't have any, any knowledge or information available. And the other issue that we see in, 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 in blueberries is the nutrition. In the previous uh, slide, the table where Lisa showed the effect of production in Eastern and Western Washington, we may see that the difference in yields is because the nutritional problems. And Matthew he, here in Michigan State just ran an experiment and he used compost you can see here the leaf analysis of this uh, study. When you use compost, uh, it's a fertilizer, you have a high nutrient content above the, the limit, and good uh, phosphor, potassium, calcium, magnesium, zinc, get everything. But when you use the conventional fertilization, you always have a deficiency in everything. McRae is a organic fertilizer, a pelletized fertilizer, but still compost is the best organic fertilizer. The only problem with compost is that the pH of compost is eight. And in order to be using blueberries, you need to bring the pH 
to at least 5.5 using sulfur. The other organic fertilizer is this for, for Bernardin from Oregon State. What she recommends is the fish emulsion and feather meal at the rate of 25 and 50 pounds per acre. So in conclusion, uh, there are many uh, alternatives, but everything depends on the willingness of the grower their level of knowledge about farming and managing the crop. If you have any questions, uh, I'll be willing to entertain them. Thank you very much, Carlos. This was great. And um, at the moment, please make sure to type your questions in the chat or the Q&A. Um, raising your hand is not going to be the best option. So if you could type the questions in there, that's going to be uh, probably the best option. And we can read the questions for you. In the webinar setting, it's not, it's not as easy to, uh, to get people to uh, connect. Um, I guess I'll have a question for you, for you, Carlos, if that's okay, while people are yeah. taking all their questions and typing them in. Um, you talked a lot about the parasitoids, and I think that's great to talk about biological control. And I hope that people know that there's different ways of doing biological control. And I, you, you talked about it from a standpoint, I, I think a little bit of conservation. So conserving what's out there by using the reduced risk insecticides. And then there's also augmentation when you talked about prices of purchasing those. And I'm wondering yes. how much adoption you're getting from organic growers in the augmentation portion of it, where people are purchasing those uh, parasitoids or other um, predators, etc., cetera, um, in their blueberry, organic blueberry systems? Is that a common practice? Yeah, I think it, this is one of the issues that we have with collecting information because there are not many growers, organic growers in Michigan. I think uh, we have around six, 16 hectares of organic production in in Michigan. I know that there are other uh, growers from MBG interested in producing organically, but one of the major issues for using uh, this uh, uh, com uh, commercially produced parasitoids is the availability. Mm. Yeah. Uh, we don't have a center of uh, distribution that can bring from California or have their own laboratories in, in the Midwest that actually we can order them and be here in in eight hours or, or overnight, because when you order those insect, insects, you need to get them overnight. You cannot order the uh, trichogramma and, and wait three days until you get to your farm and then you get another two days uh, until you disperse them. So by the end, when you open the box, they are flying all over around. This is the major issue. Okay. And uh, in, my, in my experience, I've been trying to uh, encourage growers to use biological control because I, I used to work a lot on biological control too. So in fact, I have a one, one publication on biological control. No, two publications. And, and, and I like biological control. Mm -hmm. and, um, most of my, my experience is trying to reduce the use of insecticides to the limits in which we give a chance the natural enemies to take over part of the part of the control, but yes, yeah, it's, it's a good it's a good alternative, but uh, not many people is available yeah. for uh, experimenting, or the source of the material is far away that uh, will not be able to get it at time in time. Okay, well, thank you. So we have questions in the chat. Um, the first question uh, from Josh is, what are some good blueberry varieties that you would recommend? For organic production? Yes. OK. It will depend where you are. Uh, normally, you are going to have your blueberries on their screen cages or on their call frame with, uh, with the screen. You need to have like a stand-up variety, like a duke 
or you can have look crop, but also with that with the trellis. You you should not uh, look at the variety like a legacy that is very bushy and will require a lot of management. You have to have a variety that can be uh, easy to manage, I'll need to be open to allow the air to penetrate very well in this, whatever treatment you are gonna apply, like a, a, a compost tea or other like BT that, that the insecticide penetrates very well. And also reduce the, um, the environment uh, that is suitable for the reproduction of the spotted window sophila. What we are finding here with some of our uh, growers is that they are reducing the, the width of the rows, for example, in, in raspberries to allow the, the air to move, the heat increase, and they are tre having tremendous success in managing these party windows of the raspberries, but just by reducing the the width of the, the of the row and blueberries, the same. You prune your, your your field well, you have a very good control of the party windows of the with minimum amount of even the conventional insecticides. Thank you. Uh, I missed one name of the blueberries, but I hope people caught that um, that you were recommending. I'm going to move on to another question, which is from Jill. When you refer to compost, do you mean to add it to the top of the blueberry plants? Or are you referring to adding compost when on plants? I'm not sure exactly what that means. Um, I am an organic blueberry grower and use a fabric barrier and covered it with mulch. So where, yes, I, where do you apply it? You can apply the in, in, in you can use it when you when you you do your your rice beds mixing with the with the soil and also annually or every two years just put uh, the mulch on mulch made of compost on top of the of, of the of the plants on, on the root system. So and even if you, you put the compost and then the weed mat on top it will be much better yeah. because it will last longer and, and it, you will let, have less uh, problems trying to open the mulch to incorporate new compost in the, in, in, in the ground. But again, you need to make sure that you, after you apply the compost, try to lower the pH of the soil again because it's gonna increase the pH once you apply the, the compost. Okay, thank you. So this is a question that came to us over email. Uh, if spotted wing rosophila are in the mulch during the day, can we spray an insecticide down into the mulch during the day to kill them, keeping the spray off of the plants? Uh, depends what type of mulch he's talking about. If we have a weed mat, of course you don't need to spray. They, they will be roasted once they get into the top of the uh, the mulch, the, the weed barrier will not allow them to get into the soil and they will be exposed to the predation by birds, by beetles, by parasitoids, by nematodes. And this is one of the recommendations that we are start uh, making to the growers here in Michigan. Put the weed barrier and you will see a tremendous reduction in the infestation of spider windows of even. But you have the, uh, the mulch made of uh, wood chips, oh, it will not work mm -hmm. because they have the chance to go into the, the, the soil. And even if you spray it on top of this, it will not be good. Okay. Another question over email. If you can only spray and trust twice in the season, what are the smartest times in the growing season to time those applications? And I think you mentioned that at some point when you had a kind of a calendar spray, but when would you recommend the entrust to be sprayed, the two applications allowed? One thing that we are recommending to the growers is not to allow the establishment of these, these spotted window sophila in the field. From the standpoint of biology, the spotted window sophila is what we call uh, our strategist, it means that they produce hundreds of eggs. And, and even though we kill them 
99%, whatever survive will reveal the population in a few days. And it's contrary, for example, to the uh, Kali mod or the other mods that they are Kai strategies that they can want one egg in every fruit. Therefore, for, for this kind of insect, like Paragwindosophila, the strategies that kill the, the, uh, the arriving population. As soon as they arrive, do not let them establish. How we do this? With an entrust, one of the advantages of entrust is that it penetrates inside of the fruit and remain active for seven days. Then if I see the fruit when this is at the coloring stage and my traps are telling me that I have spotted windows of Eli, I will come immediately, I will not wait and apply the insecticide and trust that will keep the population from building up. And if I have another insecticide like Paganic, I will come with a Paganic and I will, or uh, as a direct, and I will give another chance and then come again with the trust. So I will not let the, 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 uh, the population to build up. But again, I have to harvest every day. I could not rely on those insecticides and that I'm gonna be working like every three days or four days for harvesting. You need to harvest every day. And there the problem is labor. Okay, so this is a comment, not a question, but it's a, a Nigel that mentioned that he's an organic grower. Um, I'm saying he, they are an organic grower in MD6B. That I don't know what that means exactly. With about 250 mature blueberry bushes, seven varieties. I will be trying more biological control this year than before. Very helpful info and insights. Um, yeah. One thing I wanted to. Oh, go ahead. He can use that. It's just a small, a small amount of of, of, uh, of blueberries. He can use some of the nets that I showed them, like the guys from Canada. Just a, a small frame, and over the frame you drop the net. Nigel said that he's in Maryland in the six B hardiness hardiness zone. One thing I wanted to mention um, regarding the mulches is that um, I'm going to plug for our research here, but we've been testing plastic mulches that are available mm -hmm. for organic production. And we saw a significant reduction in both the adult and larval population of spotted wing drosophila. And we're averaging with those plastic mulches, whether they're black, white, or silver metallic, between 50 and 80% reductions with plastic mulches. So something for people yep. to also think about, um, they work really well at decreasing um, spotted wing drosophila populations. Yeah, you're correct. Mm -hmm. yeah. My only preference for the wind mat is that it, it lasts longer than the, the, the plastic. <laughs> yeah, and the wind mat, I mean, just, just to say as uh, looking at research is the wind mat wasn't as effective as the plastic mm -hmm. mulches. Like when we look at the results, the data, it wasn't as effective, but I agree that the weed mat is going to have an impact also on the, because I guess what people might not know is that it's over 80% of the larvae that are in the fruit that drop to the ground to pupate. And like Carlos mentioned, if they drop to the ground and they're on this weed mat or plastic mulches, they're just going to bake it there and be exposed. So it's, it's kind of that framework of thinking about it. <clears throat> Okay, we have more questions coming in. How often do you have to put the plastic down? So that's a good question. Um, I'll take that one if you don't mind, Carlos. Um, we are testing it, removing it every year um, just from research purposes, but there are some plastic mulches like that that can last, that are thicker, that can last multiple years. So we have one right now that we're uh, testing that would last about two or three years. So it would depend what thickness of the plastic you're using. Um, you could leave them longer. And some also are biodegradable, but the biodegradable are not approved organically, but you're still plastic mulches that biodegrade. Um, yeah, so another, I, oh, go ahead. No, I agree with you. Thank you. <laughs> 
another question for you, Carlos, is um, how do pollinators get into the plants when the nets are on? And that's always a big question with netting. Will, will you repeat it? Um, you how repeat do you let the pollinators in when you're using the netting? Especially oh, for we, raspberries. We bring them inside. We bring them inside. They will be happy working there. There is, there is no problem with, for them. So that would be bumblebees, right? That you bring in or do you do? You can use bumblebees, you can use bees. They, uh, there is a little interference of the, of the, uh, of the uh, net. Some people were uh, complaining that inside of the greenhouse, the, the, the hoop houses, uh, bees didn't want to work. Well, this is not a seal plastic, so this is a net and the sunlight and everything is just a decrease like a 50%, but the bees will be fine working over there. And it was one of the questions I put to the guys in, 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 uh, in, in, in Quebec. If they had any problem with the, with the pollination, I said, no, absolutely not. Mm -hmm. um, before we continue here, um, Annie's gonna have a couple poll questions for us while people think about a couple more questions. So Annie, are you there? Are you able to do that? I am here. I'm just having some technical difficulties. Bear with me for a second. Okay, thank you. Um, I guess I'll ask the next question. Well, actually, no, I'll, I'll wait because that will be, Annie will be perfect at answering that question. It's a question about, um, oh no, sorry. Is anyone doing research on allowing specific bird species as insect predators? I thought it was for uh, bird control. Birds that eat insects, not the berries. So that's that's a tricky one to have birds that are that selective. But um, Carlos, do you have an answer for that of um, birds as pest control? I think it, it, it depends on the, the, the species. If you have crows, of course, they will they will clean your crop in a <laughs> blink of an eye or uh, sterlings or some other, but there are other small birds that they just go for whatever they find in the ground. And uh, a lot of the predation is done by crabby beetles, a lot of beetles that in, in, um, in uh, larval parasitoids, wasps and nematodes. A lot of this, this work is done by this. Yeah, but there are small vertebrates squirrels and uh, other animals are really munching on those uh, larvae and, and pupae. Okay, is it important to keep the ground clean of old fallen berries to prevent spotted wing? Yeah, you clean all those berries from the ground, it will be great, but uh, it will be a big, big job. Mm -hmm. So, what is your your cost of uh, uh, production? And and also, you need to to bury those berries around uh, at, at least one feet deep into the ground in, to prevent them from immersion. Okay, here we go. We have some uh, poll questions for you, if you could answer those. First one is, how much did you learn today? And the second one, were you using things you learned today on your farm? Yeah, there's been some research on, on sanitation and burying, and yes, it will help, but like Carlos said, it's, a, it's added labor. But it composting, for example, is not a good idea. You do not wanna compost your fruit um, because that doesn't prevent um, insects from developing at all. So you want to be, um, if you can do the sanitation and pick up those fallen berries, uh, that will help. But then you'll have to destroy those berries, solarize them or bury them, and that will help control them. Yep. Um, any other questions out there? If you could please fill out the poll, that would be great. We're at 63% of people that filled it out. Okay, 
Well, I don't see any more questions. Uh, I hope everybody had a chance to, uh, to ask all their questions. We're at two minutes past the hour. So I would like to very much thank uh, Carlos for his presentation. This was very informative, um, very nice presentation and covered a lot of ground. So we really appreciate it. Again, go back into the chat earlier on and you'll see the link to the websites where this recording will be posted. Uh, it will be there probably tomorrow or the next day, um, but very quickly. And uh, uh, again, Carlos, thank you so much. We very much appreciated your time and, and knowledge. And uh, um, with that, um, I'll say thank you, everybody, and uh, have a good rest of the beginning of the growing season. Yeah, thank, thank you, you Mary. for the presentation, Christelle. Thank you, Annie. And thank you, at, at, uh, Amaya. It was great. And I hope to see you one day uh, in person. <laughs> we do too. <laughs> we do too. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Bye bye. Well, thank bye -bye. you. Bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye.